The men in this film are like most rapists. They're not stereotypical dirty old men, unattractive sex fiends, but are otherwise law-abiding citizens, faithful husbands, or even good-looking boys next door. They're men like Brian, a 31-year-old ex-military hero. Bob, a 38-year-old father of two. Bill, the introverted son of an accountant. Fred, a 28-year-old former policeman. And James, a gifted child with a genius IQ. Collectively, these five men have committed over 150 sex crimes. Rape has reached epidemic proportions in the United States, where one woman in five will be raped at some point in her life. But these men are only representative of the one rapist in 60 who was ever caught and convicted. But even then, when finally revealed, most people are surprised by who the rapist really is. You know, I mean, like when I was arrested in Manson, the county jail, I had about 300 people to sign a petition saying you got the wrong man. I have a major problem identifying myself as a sex criminal. A sex offender. Somebody goes out and rapes women. I knew <clears throat> all this time that the things I was doing was rape and, and molesting children, and that it was against the law. It was a crime. It was serious, but I wouldn't stop myself. Rarely is the rapist caught, and even when he is, rarely does punishment do any good. In most states, rapists will serve a few years in prison before being released back into society. Four out of five fully 80% of all rapists will then rape again, sometimes hundreds of times. Until recently, rapists were regarded as incurable and incapable of rehabilitation. But now, in a few states, a new approach is being tried. In Oregon, rapists must first do time in prison, but once they're within four years of being released, they may volunteer for treatment at Oregon State Hospital in Salem. There, for the first time in their lives, Rapists start to face up to their crimes and to themselves. 1973, I attempted to rape and, and my mother, and, and failing that, I stabbed her three times and killed her. Nobody wanted me, nobody gave a shit about me. I couldn't fit in society anyway, so I didn't give a damn, you know. I wanted to be destructive. The 33 sex offenders in the Oregon program have committed over 25,000 sexual crimes ranging from obscene phone calls to rape. Consequently, therapists know that if they can successfully treat one man, they can often prevent a staggering number of innocent women and children from being victimized in the future. So far, they've had a 95% success rate with those rapists who have completed the four years of treatment. Robert Freeman Longo, director of the sex offender unit, says that though all rapists are dangerous men, they rape for different reasons. There's a, a power type of rape where the dynamics are such where this individual who's the rapist is feeling a lack of power in his life, a lack of control over his own life, and so he retaliates and tries to regain or gain a sense of power by overcoming others. Another type of rapist, a sadistic sort of rapist, is somebody who simply put a rod of size as someone else's pain and discomfort. There's uh, anger rapists whose motivation tend to be anger in terms of why they rape, um, the release of anger on a helpless victim, much more of a spontaneous, explosive sort of an assault. And probably the one that people see as, as when they picture rape, what a rape really is. Two out of three rapists will leave the beds of their girlfriends or wives to commit their crime, stalking a victim upon whom they can vent their rage or desire for power or pain. Brian is a typical case an anger rapist who struck at any time, any place, his violent attacks fueled by something more than a simple desire for sex. I didn't want to be responsible. I wanted what I wanted. I wanted excitement. I wanted control. And I didn't care how I got it. Brian was a former army ranger and a 24-year-old married man with three young daughters when he became a rapist. After getting off work as a diesel mechanic at midnight, Brian would drive around the deserted streets of Portland, Oregon in a rage. 
know, I mean, like I would be thinking a lot of thoughts around how I'm not seeing my needs met sexually. I'd be thinking about the military, you know, very strongly as far as how I would uh, have high excitement levels in the military. I wanted to find those high excitement levels that were arousing. And in my thinking, the best thing for me to do for that was to rape. I look for nice apartments. Because in my thinking, I would think, well, you know, nice apartments, nice people live there. The first rape I ever committed, that's, that's the way it was. I mean, like, I just, you know, saw an apartment, went up to the door and opened the door, and, and went inside. And when I went inside, I, uh, I had a weapon, I had a knife, and, um, I would uh, threaten the victim with her life if she would not do this for me. Looking back on it, Brian doesn't know where the anger began. He grew up in a closely knit family that included three brothers and a sister. His father was a truck driver, while his mother managed a small farm they lived on. Brian was a poor kid, but no different than millions of other youngsters. I feel I had a, uh, in the most part, a normal childhood. My mom and dad didn't do anything to me differently you know, than any other parent did. Like any normal teenager, Brian dated a series of girls until age 17, when he fell in love with a 16-year-old in his junior class at high school. The teen sweetheart soon married and had their first child, a healthy and beautiful baby daughter. And that summer, after graduation, Brian realized a lifelong dream when he enlisted in the Army's prestigious Ranger Corps. It reinforced the macho in me, you know, the uncaring for people. It reinforced the fact that uh, I'm getting mine and the hell of the other guy. Brian got what he wanted, his corporal's stripes, medals, and letters of commendation for heroism. He was just about to re-enlist when he made an error of judgment on a ranger maneuver and was busted back to private. In a rage, Brian quit the military he loved and his anger only grew in civilian life. He was having a difficult time making ends meet on his pay as a mechanic, and he and his wife weren't getting along. I was thinking in my mind that I'm tired of being jerked around by my wife. I'm tired of being jerked around by society. I'm tired of doing things for other people. I'm tired of coming out of the military, something I enjoyed doing. So by God, I'm going to get what I wanted. A few nights after his first rape, Brian was back in his car, prowling the deserted street. When he spotted a woman coming out of a bar alone, Brian started to follow her Volkswagen van. His second victim was now in his sight. All he needed was an opportunity. Basically, I followed her for close to about 30 to 40 miles just thinking about when she pulls over, what I'm going to do to her. Um, I was getting real excited about that, thinking about uh, I'm going to get my needs met sexually. I'm going to you know, get what I want accomplished. But the Volkswagen van continued to speed through the countryside, and Brian knew he had to act fast. I was getting a long gas. Try to do something real quick. And so uh, I pulled my car up alongside of her Volkswagen bus and I ran her off the road. She followed me and she got loose and she ran out in the woods. And uh, I ran after her. I can remember at the time I had a lot of increased anger over the fact that this was so hard, you know, for me to get what I wanted. And I remember that I, you know, caught her in the woods and we wrestled around and I threw her to the ground. And I took my knife out and I cut her shirt. And uh, I cut her shirt in about two or three different places. And my intentions were to, you know, let her see that I'm in business. I mean, as far as she knew, she was dead. During the next four months, five other women were told they were going to die while Brian held a knife to their throats. And some of the notes where I learned is, you know, how to install fear. Fear tactics get people attention, makes people... Uh, to you know, render themselves to do what you want them to do. 
my victims, they were terrified. In treatment, the first and primary object always is to put men like Brian in touch with the terror of their victims. Consequently, he and other sex offenders must listen to a police tape of a rape in progress. Police department. The man is trying to break in my door. I don't, I don't know who he is. He said, let me in. What is your address? I'm 2937. I want you to stay on the telephone. Okay? Okay. Where are you now? I locked the front door and I'm upstairs in the bedroom. Is there anyone with you? No, just my baby. Seconds later, police arrived at the scene and arrested the rapist. The recording was used at his trial, and he was convicted. The best way to look at, about my victims, on how you know they were affected, uh, what they went through, is to think about how I you know, would go through to a similar instance. Think about how bad I was in that house, and also that 350-pound man broke through that door and had a big knife and came to me. And was, you know, slapping me around, pushing me around. He held a knife on me and made me perform those sexual acts, uh, rape me. How would I handle that? Um, and when I start to think about that, it's like uh, I can see in a lot of uh, contrast what they went through. Because I know that, I mean, like, it would leave me devastated. It would leave me uh, empty, cold. Um... One night, Brian was stopped by police for a routine traffic violation just seconds after leaving the apartment building of his latest victim. In April 1979, the 24-year-old pled guilty to four charges of rape and three of sodomy. On the day he arrived at a medium security institute to start serving his 40-year sentence, he received his divorce papers from his wife. Brian became a born-again Christian and model prisoner and four years later, he volunteered for treatment at Oregon State Hospital. To his therapist, Rebecca Ryan, Brian seems to be sincere about changing. It really bothers me. Mm -hmm. You know, it bothers me to look at that and to, to keep seeing that. You know, he can be very friendly. He can be, he can be concerned about you. He can say things that sound um, caring. But... There are times when you when you can really see. I can't forget who these people are. I can't be charmed by them. They're not. I know they're not charming people. I know. I know their potential. And and uh, the purpose here is to dig past all that and to get to to who they really are. Brian has hidden sides to his nice guy personality. Men have varying sexual fantasies. But sex offenders, like Brian, have powerful ones of rape that they play out in their crimes. Consequently, a major part of his treatment is devoted to reprogramming Brian and changing his sexual fantasies. Twice a week, he goes to a laboratory where he's shown violent scenes of rape. A gauge attached to his genitals gives readings on a machine, much like a lie detector. And whenever Brian shows he's getting excited, a therapist will give him an unpleasant no, dose of ammonia. No, no, no. 
What do you see going on with her? <laughs> I'm seeing a woman that's completely scared of her in her face. Her eyes are just put on her face. It's like, my God, what's happening to me? You don't want your what expressions on your victim say? Oh, they were the same thing. I didn't know what was going to happen to her neck. I could ever die, I'm going to die. For years, rapists like Brian have masturbated to their fantasies of rape. That makes them difficult to reprogram. After a year of aversion therapy, Brian is no longer sexually aroused by You're scenes of violent out. rape. Yesterday's tape. See here. It's about a straight line. All right. Brian's therapists believe that if he can understand fully the hurt and damage that rape victims endure, there's a good chance he won't reoffend once he's released. To understand the ordeal of a victim, Brian and other offenders are sometimes confronted by women, all of whom have been raped in the past. The confrontation sessions are therapeutic not only for the rapist, but also for the victims who are finally able to vent feelings they've often kept inside for years. That makes me sick, the idea of having somebody like you running around in a whole town, a whole city, a whole state of people that don't know what you are. You don't look any different from anybody else. We want you fixed. Fixed or put away. You know what it's like not to want to send your kid down the damn street to go to the store because some pervert is probably going to pick them up and tear them apart like your life's been torn apart? You know what it's like to have to have sex with your husband? and think about some mauler drooling all over you? There is no excuse. I knew I was hurting somebody, but I never um, stopped to really see what kind of hurt. I mean, I would justify it. I would uh, minimize it as far as just saying to myself, that, you know, you know, they're, it's not showing no physical damage in my eyes at the time. So I would justify in my mind and say, don't get over it. The dad had to use a knife though, wasn't it? Doesn't make you very macho, does it? And the stock and chase down and walked into their house and had to pull a knife and hold it to their throat and threaten to kill him. Here I'm <laughs> you are. What's going to keep you from being a sick son of a bitch the rest of your life? What's going to keep you from going out there and pulling a knife on somebody again and doing it all over again? Brian, if you think this hurts, how do you think it would feel to be laying there having that knife to your throat and not know whether you're going to see the next day or not? You know what? You think about what our system does for you. You're in here getting help. You're in here getting counseling. What's the victim do? She's got to spend the rest of her life sitting behind a goddamn locked door, hoping her husband's going to understand, hoping her kids are going to understand, Hoping her parents understand because the system twists it all around and points the finger at her like she's some street walking scum who goes out there and asks to be raped. If we get counseling, we pay for it ourselves. We're paying for your counseling. I think it's crucial that people work with the victims of these men. But it, it's kind of like Somebody can be pushing somebody off a cliff and you catching them at the bottom only so long and then you're going to give out. You know, sometimes you got to hike up the cliff and find out who's throwing these people off and see if you can do something about that. And I think that that's what we're trying to do here. Unfortunately for too many rape victims, there is still little they can do to protect themselves from killers like Jane. I've been told by my therapist, we went, we went to visit my mom's grave. I've never been there. Um, and one of the things he told me when we were up there is that when I killed my mom, I killed part of me too. 
and I'm trying to learn how to put part of that back. As a child, James was a gifted youngster whose IQ tested out at the genius level. By the time he reached his teens, however, he was doing badly at school. It was the late 60s, and like many teenagers then, James was in full rebellion against a strict stepfather, an army colonel, and a submissive mother. I was 14 when I got a subscription to Playboy magazine. My parents didn't care, and I started masturbating to that, and I quickly found that just the pictures wasn't exciting enough, so I started using a lot of deviant self-talk, fantasizing these women in, in humiliating situations, and that became more exciting and more powerful. And it went from that, that to attempting to do that, have, forcing a woman to do that, and I committed my first rape when I was 16. Shortly afterward, James left home, and for the next three years would drift around the country, going from commune to commune. Along the way, he would rape five women. None of his victims ever reported James, and his self-disgust grew. After a second suicide attempt failed, James was taken out of a mental hospital by his mother. That night, as she slept, James attacked her sexually, and when she woke and resisted, her 20-year-old son stabbed her to death with his pocket knife. I felt that my parents, my mom in particular, didn't give a shit. I remember that when I was growing up, I was physically abused by, most, by both my dad and my stepdad. And my feelings was my mom encouraged that by not interfering, by not doing anything or saying anything about it. And uh, it was a real intense love-hate thing with my mom, real intense. I loved her and I hated her at the same time. And I attempted in a real sick way, tried to show her I loved her by attempting to rape her, and failing that, wound up hating her again and killed her. James received a 35-year sentence for the murder of his mother, but in prison, he saved the life of a guard in a fire. As a reward for his heroism, James was paroled, and after moving to Oregon, fell in love with Louise, a medical secretary. They married, and she was soon pregnant. But just a few weeks before the birth of his son, James raped a woman who lived in the next door apartment. At the trial, Louise learned from the prosecutor the truth about her husband's past. You know, it makes me sick to think that he could actually do something like that because the side of him that I saw when we got married and everything, he was, he was playing a role. Why would you say that? A lot of women in the corner. I go a lot on gut feeling. And something has down in my gut that said, okay, you know, you're going through hell, but it's going to be worth it. I think I'm doing it a lot for me, too. Because I can always look back and say, I tried. Most wives will divorce sex offenders at some point, but Louise has tried to keep her marriage together for five years. Despite her support, James has proven to be a difficult case to treat. Even with the use of ammonia and then electric shock in aversion therapy, James still continued to get excited by scenes of violent rape that he was shown in the lab. As a last resort, he was given injections of a female hormone drug called Depo-Provera. That enabled him to at last control his fantasies of rape and torture, and recently he was taken off the drug. Despite James' progress, his therapist, Richard Reed, remains cautious about the future. It's a very close call with him. He uh, still remains a very detached, unemotional kind of person. I like some of the things he's doing with his wife. I think that maybe for the first time in his life he's beginning to feel some interest, some care, some concern about his his wife and his child that isn't based on his own want, his own self-desires. I've been real fortunate. I've been, I've stayed married. Uh, I got a five-year-old son and he means the world to me. And he's been molested. He was molested eight months ago by a neighbor. And How did you feel about that? It tore me up. 
and all I came more from the sense that my God, the same things are happening to him that were happening to me, and is he going to turn out to be like me? That's what the fear was. That's what the fear is. You know, seeing him do perform some of the same behaviors that I did at the same age already. I'm, I, I, it terrifies me. Is him being the same kind of person that his father is? James has good reason to worry about his son. Over 60% of the sex offenders in his treatment program were sexually abused as children. Oregon researchers still do not fully understand why victims go on to become offenders, nor are they 100% certain that men like James can be successfully treated. In July 1985, James was sent back to prison to await a hearing of the parole board which will decide whether the five years in prison he served is sufficient punishment for the murder of his mother. I hate what they've done. I just despise the behavior. Yeah. They do the kinds of things <clears throat> people aren't supposed to do to other human beings. No caring, rational person should do that, and yet they do it. And they give themselves all sorts of excuses why it's okay. And why, when they're caught, somehow that they end up being the victim. I want to treat them for one major reason, is that every single man in my group, and that's true for every single man in the program, within six months to four years will be back in the community. And uh, past history will often predict what will happen in the future. We know that every single man we have here has had more than one victim, some hundreds, and I know that without some form of intervention, they'll continue to do it. Until recently, therapists believed there was little they could do with sadistic rapists like Bill. And even today, Bill isn't sure if he's even worth treating. I still think the guys like me who kill, rape, should be killed. Looking back on his childhood, Bill blames himself for becoming a sex offender. As the only son of an accountant, he grew up in a middle-class home in Chicago where he was babied and loved by his mother and three older sisters. But at 13, Bill developed an ordinary case of teenage acne, and his attitude towards women changed. I felt like I was too ugly, too stupid, too inadequate. Like a lot of sex offenders, Bill started as a neighborhood peeping Tom in Salem, Oregon, where his family had moved. I'd masturbate when they'd take it undress. And it started out just like that, just looking at the bodies, not really wanting to do anything. It wasn't that bold yet. After weeks of peeping on a woman who lived nearby, Bill decided one night to realize his rape fantasy. Arming himself with a club he fashioned out of some garden furniture, Bill forced open a door while his victim showered. I went in, looked around a little bit, make sure no one else was there. Went into the bathroom. He was still bathing. I thought I'd go and see myself in the mirror. Remember that? Remember my eyes? How they looked wild. And, uh, I remember feeling uh, scared. Like that sense of power. Then a little while after that, she came out of the shark. And that's why I hit her in the head with the club. I knocked her. Of the shower. She was pretty hysterical, crying, covering up. Bill then dragged his victim into the bedroom where she pleaded with him. She just had a baby, she said, 
and couldn't have sex. So all that stuff together. Plus my nerves. Um, I couldn't uh, complete the rape. The peeping continued while Bill's fantasies became even more violent, so that when a movie based on the life of the Boston Strangler attracted his attention, it would have a profound effect. It gave me ideas and fed the excitement of the fantasies I was having. It was infamous. Because you know, I felt like I'm nothing. That way, I can feel like something. For several months, Bill watched a number of women. Then one night, he was peeping on a potential victim, and the circumstances were right. That night was really windy and stormy. When I when it's like that, I feel like uh, I felt like I could do anything I wanted because uh, I didn't have to worry about making noise. I didn't have to worry about being seen. I just felt really safe, powerful. You know, I guess the way a leopard feels at night. When his victim opened a window, Bill was ready to strike. After waiting for his victim to fall asleep, Bill went through the screen window and crept into her bedroom. I decided to uh, choke her. Was unconscious, and I'd rape her. I remember telling myself uh, while I was doing that, uh, I was saying to myself, "I have to do this. I have to do this." I didn't know she was there. I thought I tried checking her pulse after I was done raping. home and after watching television with his father went to bed he was just 17 for the next seven years the murder of a 26 year old Salem social worker would remain unsolved during that period her killer moved to Arizona where he lived with a beauty parlor operator his fantasies of rape torture and murder continued but Bill's crimes had stopped By 1978, Bill was working in construction in Portland, Oregon. He was married, but the rape fantasies continued until Bill finally acted on them and molested his 10-year-old stepdaughter. She reported him, and after being arrested, he confessed to all of his sex crimes, including the unsolved murder seven years earlier. He was given a life sentence, and after serving eight years, volunteered for treatment. He is a typical sadistic rapist who enjoys fantasies of inflicting pain on his victims. To his therapist, Richard Reed, there is only one reason a killer like Bill should be given treatment. He's uh, a very dangerous man. I certainly think he's capable of doing that again. Um, if we're not going to lock him up forever, we've got an obligation to treat him, to protect the community out there. How old do you see, Bill? I see a young girl, maybe about nine years old. Uh, taken off her uh, shirt. Before therapists can try to reprogram Bill's fantasies, they must first determine what forms of deviant sex he finds exciting. In the lab, he is shown pornographic slides and videos, and the machine measuring his arousal yields some interesting results. We got the female children over here, and the arousal went, went up quite a bit. The prospect of raping a woman no longer excites him. But victimizing a young girl does. I still have fantasies about a young girl. If I was in a situation where there was a young girl available, I didn't really have to use a lot of force or anything. 
use manipulation or whatever to get her to have sex with me, I probably would. For police everywhere, sex criminals like Bill remain a mystery. Some studies suggest that nine out of ten sex crimes still go unreported. And with those that are, the chances of rapists like Bill getting caught and convicted are still less than one in 60. To find out how and why they get away with it, law enforcement agencies like the FBI and Oregon State Police regularly come to the hospital. And their videotaped interviews are later used in training sessions and victim awareness programs. What advice would you give to women to help keep them from becoming identified as a potential victim? If you are alone, so as be aware. Keep a defensive perimeter around yourself and keep your eyes, keep your awareness up, basically what it is. Don't leave your windows open. Um, the lady that I murdered um, left her window, opened her window before she went to bed. And so I think they need to be aware of their windows and screens and how easy it would be to get in. people who I wanted to have in there. You know about that? Why do you think that I'm asking to have you in there? With Bill, we want him to understand what he, he did. Understand that he took another human being's life. He can't think much lower than that. With that, if I think if he really comes in contact with what, he, what he's done, I'm not sure how he could live with that. But making Bill feel something for his victims and crimes is always the goal of treatment. Sometimes the barriers of a cold-blooded killer will finally collapse as he watches the mother of an 18-year-old girl who was raped and murdered. I felt I had been disemboweled without anesthesia. I just felt like I was living dead. I, uh, I had to be there. I couldn't sit still. I was waiting for Vince to come home. I felt helpless and... I couldn't stay at home. I had to be where it had all happened. If I had to choose one word to describe Stephanie, it would be sunshine. She was everything beautiful, caring, intelligent, gifted. Did you have flashes of what you've done? Your victim? All the... about that. Sometimes I feel like I want to die. Get it over with. Like I deserve it. Sometimes I don't feel nothing. What about you, Fred? Did you experience some things during the film? Yeah, a lot of anger, really. Something like that happened. It could happen. Anger at what? Be specifically about the anger. Anger at the people that did it. Did you relate to any of it? No, not really. You didn't relate to it at all? No. I've always, and I still do compartmentalize things. There's just these couple of little bad things that I've done, and they're sitting over here, and the rest of me is a real nice guy. From an early age, Fred was a nice kid who always wanted to become a policeman. Growing up on a ranch in southern Oregon, Fred was a dutiful son who did his chores and looked after his younger brother. In high school, he did volunteer work with the handicapped and became leader of a junior mason group dedicated to honesty and the protection of women. Following graduation, Fred married his steady girlfriend and joined the Army, where he became a military policeman. But in January 1978, his father, whom Fred loved and respected, died suddenly. Fred and his wife flew home from Fairbanks, Alaska, and after the funeral, Fred went out for a drive alone. He was angry at the world when he pulled over to ask a passerby for directions. Fred then surprised the woman by producing a gun and ordering her into his truck. 
But as he sped away, Fred didn't know what he was going to do with his terrified victim. I'm not very well in touch with what was really going on in my mind. I really needed somebody to unload to. I also wanted to have somebody to take the guilt on that felt like somebody had to be responsible for my dad dying. In a remote field, his victim was helpless as Fred raped and sodomized her. Afterwards, they got dressed and drove her back to where she said she lived and dropped her off. Um, when the police came, they didn't have any trouble finding me. I knew everybody in the small town where I was from. I knew everybody on the police force. My best friend was one of the detectives on the Ashland Police Force. That's how I got into law enforcement in the first place. Fred was arrested the next morning, pled guilty, and was sentenced to 15 years. His wife immediately divorced him, and after serving two and a half years of his sentence, Fred was released on parole. I didn't think I would reoffend. In fact, the way I lived with it was that I told myself that I was temporary insanity. That, you know, because of the death of my father, I was temporarily insane. That's the reason behind it, that there wasn't anything wrong with me. Fred enrolled in college, where he soon fell in love with a phys ed major who was unaware of his previous crime. They married, and Fred went into the contracting business with his father-in-law. Fred's future again looked bright until the summer of 1984. His business had soured, he was having marital problems, and Fred began to have fantasies of raping again. I had taken into the habit of driving around and actually looking for someone to rape. And I had picked up several female hitchhikers and hadn't done it, just given them rides. Late one afternoon, Fred picked up a woman hitchhiking alongside the road. She had a large dog along for protection, but that didn't stop Fred from making a sudden detour off the main highway where he handcuffed the woman to the steering wheel and got rid of her dog. Fred then drove to an isolated woods where his terrified victim offered no further resistance. After raping and sodomizing her, Fred drove his victim home like an old friend. You now, I told her all about myself. The last thing I told her my full name. Uh, two days later, the cops come to see me and they arrest me again, kidnap and sodomy this time. From jail, Fred made his one call to his wife. And she asked me if I had actually done it, and I said yes. And what she told, all she said, Fred, I really think you're going to have to get some help. And that's basically when I said, yeah, she's right. There's something wrong. After serving less than one year of his 15-year sentence, Fred volunteered for treatment in the sex offender program. Like some rapists, Fred is a difficult offender to classify. His two rapes motivated by a mixture of anger and a desire for power. But like all rapists, Fred is self-centered and doesn't feel anything for his victim. I, I don't know her. I don't know what she's like or where she's from. Mm -hmm. but I have trouble with feeling if she's first thing. So, if you're in the community a month from now or a year from now, and you come across a stranger, you don't have any empathy because she's a stranger, what's going to keep you from raping her? You have the urge and desire. I don't know at the moment. I don't either. I doubt anything. Forcing rapists like Brian and Fred to relate to women is a major goal of treatment, and the hospital depends on volunteer workers like Suzanne to help out. I became involved in the, the whole issue of sex abuse because I was raped myself, and I had friends who were victims of incest, and I knew what it was like, and um, I live with that fear myself every day, and I felt like I had to do something to understand why it happened. I have a feeling, too, that, uh, you know, know thy enemy kind of thing, that I feel a little safer um, knowing what they're like and why they do what they do and what their problems are. 
there was something about having that knowledge that I, I feel more in control of if I should get in a situation. Although, you know, when you get down to a weapon stuck in your head, there's not much you can do. And I know what that's like, too. It happens, it happens. I can recall 25 child and adult victim things. 15 children and 10 adults. And I didn't really pick a victim. It was, I mean, I didn't stalk a victim or lay in wait someplace like where I knew somebody would be coming by alone or just jump. It was people that I knew, people I was acquainted with. I maybe only met them that evening. But I still, they knew who I was and I knew who they were to some degree. Bob was only 13 when he attempted to rape a six-year-old girl in his neighborhood. Police and the juvenile court referred him to a psychologist for testing. But after examining Bob's middle-class background as the son of a respected businessman, the attempted rape was dismissed as a temporary disorder caused by adolescent sexual changes. Back at his private Catholic school, Bob seemed a normal teenager, dating girls regularly. But in his senior year, Bob and a date got drunk and started necking in a parked car. Everything seemed to go all right to a point, and then she said no. And at that point, I just said bullshit. I'm not taking this anymore, and I raped her. She was a virgin. I hurt her pretty bad. I, I, she was screaming at me to stop, slapping at me. I, just, I didn't listen. I just went ahead and put her one. And I found out after that, about a year later, that she had a child by me. I never talked to her, I never called her, I never, I never tried to see how she was doing, if she needed anything. I just took off my first problem and went about with my life. Bob studied aeronautics at college. He then served three years in Vietnam and finally settled in California in 1970. During those years, he would rape several women he dated. Unfortunately, like a majority of rape victims, none of the women Bob raped ever reported the crime to police. I was very unlucky, I think, because I didn't get stopped a long time. I didn't have the guts to stop myself. It's unfortunate for all the other victims that some victim down the line didn't turn. Bob went from bad to worse. By 1983, his second marriage was falling apart. He was unemployed and drunk most of the time, and Bob turned to victims easier to control. After molesting several daughters of friends and neighbors, none of whom ever reported him, Bob one day took several kids, including a blind seven-year-old girl, to the park to play. So I went over to pick her up out of the swing, and I noticed that she was, her panties were wet. She urinated on herself while she was in the swing. So I took her to the bathroom in the process of cleaning her up, and I molested her in the bathroom. So I just saw an opportunity. And took because she was blind, she was helpless. Didn't really know. I think she knew what I was doing, but she didn't know what to do about it. Unlike his other victims, the blind girl reported the crime to her mother. Bob immediately confessed to police. She didn't know me very well. She knew who I was. But she was blind. She didn't see me. To program director Robert Freeman Longo. Bob is a typical power rapist. They feel put down, their self-concept is extremely low, and as a result, they're aroused sexually by overpowering somebody. And they say, when I was doing that, I felt powerful. It was my turn to be in charge, my turn to take control. Unlike anger rapists who often beat up their victims, power rapists like Bob usually don't harm their victims physically. Consequently, they have a hard time understanding the psychological ordeal they put their victims through. After months in treatment, Bob's therapist, Richard Reed, tries another way to get him to understand the plight of his blind seven-year-old victim. If you want to close your eyes and visualize it and try to see it or feel it as she might have experienced it because she didn't have sight. So maybe you can kind of experience it as she might have as a sightless girl. I don't want to do this. But he's been nice to me. He hasn't hurt me. Maybe if I just go along, he won't 
nothing, will happen, nothing bad will happen and you won't tell on me for wetting my pants. God, I wish we could get out of here and go home. Now I can't tell what he's doing. Do I tell him no? What do I do? Why is this happening? I thought he was a nice guy. I trusted him. He seemed like a nice guy. And now he's doing this to me. Critics of treatment programs often view them as a soft way for violent and dangerous men to avoid their just punishment. But in fact, the vast majority of sex offenders in the Oregon program voluntarily choose to return to prison and serve their sentences, rather than continue to be forced in treatment to deal with themselves, their crimes, and their victims. About a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I wanted to give it up. I came real close to uh, just saying the heck with it and going back. And Rapists like Brian find treatment harder than prison where drugs, pornography, and sex are usually available. But the reason he and a small minority go through four years of painful treatment is simple. For men like Brian, Fred, Bob, and Bill, treatment is the last chance to lead a normal, crime-free life. There are no cures for men who rape, but there is the real hope that with treatment, they can control their deviant fantasies and stop raping innocent victims. I've told most of you, it seems there are a good many of you, that you come over, it's not going to be easy. And uh, you get here and then you kind of say, well, you told me it was going to be easy, but you never promised me I'd be dying in the process of going through treatment. But I think that's kind of what it's all about. You're kind of burying an old person, a dangerous person that's uh, not cared for others, and you're hopefully giving rebirth to a new person, a new personality. During the program's first six years, 20 sex offenders have completed treatment and been released into the community. So far, only one has reoffended. Brian, Bob, Fred, and Bill are still in treatment. <laughs> 